I'm a proud partner of Card Kingdom. Use cardkingdom.com slash studies when shopping for all things magic. Kublai Khan does not necessarily believe everything Marco Polo says when he describes the cities visited on his expeditions, but the Emperor of the Tartars does continue listening to the young Venetian with greater attention and curiosity than he shows any other messenger or explorer of his. In the lives of emperors, there is a moment which follows pride in the boundless extension of the territories we have conquered, and the melancholy and relief of knowing we shall soon give up any thought of understanding them. Italo Calvino's introduction to his 1972 experimental novel titled Invisible Cities sets the mood for my meditations on Ravnica. There are two characters who occupy the frame narrative of these stories. Kublai Khan, the aging monarch who has tasked Marco Polo, a traveling merchant, to describe to him all the cities of his vast empire. The Venetians' chronicles make up the majority of the vignettes. Marco Polo describes to Kublai Khan a myriad of fantastical worlds and uncanny locations. Halfway through the novel, though, we learn that Polo is not describing various cities across Khan's empire, but rather Venice, over and over and over again. Every new city is simply a retelling of an aspect of Venice in a different light. Ravnica, like Calvino's Venice, is impossible to pinpoint to a singular description. Like Marco Polo's stories, this plane is divided into a million little microcosms that overlap in otherworldly ways. Ravnica to its citizens is multiform. Ravnica to its players is even more fluid. My experience with the city is perhaps similar, but never the same as yours. Given the non-linear and randomized nature of card games, no two encounters with this world are alike. And so as a result, Ravnica is its own invisible city, a setting with general boundaries but no clear or perfect definition. Like Venice, the perspective shifts with every new visit. Today I want to look at the elements of Ravnica that render it so difficult to grasp in its entirety. Last time, I concentrated on how colors can create a sense of identity and mood in a set. This time, I want to look at the city itself, the one hiding behind all these fantasy creatures occupying the center of the card frames. I want to shine light on the efforts that go into world building and the effects they have on illustration. These structures are often overlooked, so I want to slow down and analyze their place in the construction of an image. Above all, I'm interested in thinking about the city, as a place, as an idea, and as a character all its own. In 2016, Mike Linneman wrote an article titled Architecture on Innistrad, in which he referenced all of the real-world buildings that the creative team reimagined in forming the beloved plane of gothic horror. As with many of his articles, Mike juggled with the question, how much realism do you want in your fantasy? This piece has stuck with me since I read it for the first time, and has inspired the research and thinking that drives this video. Ravnica, like Innistrad, joins the ranks of settings that interface with our world and put a magical twist on it. We can find examples of the source material in our day-to-day -day lives, which bridges the fantasy and the real, and allows us to better imagine living on this plane. This plane in particular is magic's riff on medieval and renaissance Prague. Europe as a whole is so rich with many of the fantasy tropes that lead to excellent starting points for world building and story crafting, and Prague is the perfect prototype to tap into. It has seen centuries of artistic and architectural development, it has been the subject of conquest, of monarchies and dynasties, and even the seat of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV in the 14th century. Prague was also subject to German occupation during the Second World War, and has since become an affluent epicenter for tourism and work. With every new political and cultural development came new buildings. Walking around Prague, or any major city in Europe for that matter, is like touring a museum in the open air. So in translating a city like Prague into Ravnica, I wondered what the creative team studied and discussed in the concept bush. I called up magic artist Titus Lunter once again to get some insight. My name is Titus Lunter. I am a illustrator. I work primarily for Magic the Gathering and Wizards of the Coast, and I've been building worlds since 2010. Ravnica has taken sort of the best of 600 years of European architecture. Mm. We're taking the coolest doors, we're taking the coolest archways, we're sticking them on top of the coolest windows, and this forms this horrible kind of amalgamation, this Frankenstein's monster of, of a building, and what we then do is we, we trim off all the bits that we don't need, and then a unified whole kind of pops out. And I think that's what's unique 
uh, about the about the uh, Ravnica, the generic Ravnica architecture, right? The generic buildings and spires and stuff that we see. Titus was part of the concept team for the Guilds of Ravnica block in 2018, which marked the third visit to the City of Guilds. His team could draw upon all the visual information found in the entirety of the two blocks prior, some 1,200 cards and the vast mechanical and design theory that has been produced since. In 2005, when Ravnica debuted, though, there was no point of reference for the world builders. They had to render the city from scratch. I know that Ravnica is synonymous at this point with the Ten Guilds, but I want to concentrate for a moment on just how unorthodox the first set was, simply by virtue of bringing magic to the urban center. At its core and origin, magic is a game about resources. The entire mechanism hinges on the five basic lands and the colors they represent. The first Ravnica set succeeded in conceptualizing the ten ways you can combine these colors, as I explored in the previous video, but it also inverted the concept of the basic land and the idea of mana as a product of the natural environment. Prior to 2005, every magic set was still looking towards the Tolkien-esque models of high fantasy as a source of inspiration for its creative design. All the basic lands echoed this approach. They used nature as the example of beauty and power. For ten years, islands, mountains, forests, swamps, and plains resembled vistas in national parks and romantic visions of faraway lands. Mirrodin's arrival in 2003 was the first break in this tradition, but Ravnica, a couple of years later, entirely redefines the concept of a basic land. To bring wizards and goblins to a renaissance cityscape was a fissure to convention. Ravnica was, visually speaking, anti-magic, and the basic land suite embodied this transgression. Instead of depicting a literal mountain for red mana, artists instead had to capture what Jeremy Cranford called the essence of the basic mountain. In order to better inform his concept artists on how to recreate that energy for the first block, he took them on a field trip to various locations around Washington. Hiking near Mount Rainier and exploring the undercity of downtown Seattle helped his team reform the meaning of nature in the context of a city. The first 20 basic lands, four for each color of mana, were the starting points for establishing Ravnica's visual identity. In these, we see very cleanly the presence of the magical energy they are supposed to produce. The swamps, like Seattle's underground, are foggy and tinged with green, the mountains are violently red like the foundries the artists saw on their field trip, and the islands are nestled between waterfalls flowing from dams. The forests, of course, are blanketed with trees, and the plains show sweeping views of the whole cityscape illuminated by daylight. In these basic lands, players fully understood that this set was meant to break with tradition and reinvent the concept of a fantasy world. The radical shift in setting was also present in one of the original set's marquee cards, Birds of Paradise. By 2005, this creature had already become an iconic piece of magic history, showing up in multiple core sets and receiving a new look in 7th edition. In both iterations prior, the birds are very clearly at home in the tropics, but Ravnica's birds are completely contrasted by the presence of a towering, gothic-esque cathedral in the background. Long ago, birds of paradise littered the skies, reads the flavor text. Thanks to the city's sprawl, most now exist as pets of society's elite. This card echoes the paranoias that we may be feeling in our lives with every new suburban development or skyscraper that replaces a park or an open field. So in marketing, in the basic lands, and on a high-profile and somewhat nostalgic card, the city's presence was explicit. Looking through the image gallery of the entire first block, however, Ravnica's first iteration was still very much seeking to establish its identity. So many of these cards either hint at a city or shy away from showing it at all. Artists could circumvent having to paint such intricate buildings by simply having their subjects interact with materials at ground level. These huge stones behind Carrion Howler, Watchwolf, even Remand, for example, are a staple of Ravnican architecture. The thick, low vaults around Court Hussar also help place us in the city without needing much else. But cards like Aura Touched Mage and Guardian's Mage Mark were still drawing upon the aesthetics of high fantasy to inform their compositions. These cards read more like iterations on the never-ending story than city subjects of the mid-2000s. Some artists, of course, were commissioned to include the city in all its glory in their backgrounds. Daggerclaw Imp shows us how the city can help guide a composition. The sharp edges, the tilted camera at a Dutch angle, the way the spires fly against the imp who is dive-bombing onto an unsuspecting victim all aid in providing movement. The monochromatic background solidifies the contrast between the elegant and the grotesque. Psychic Possession gives us a glimpse of the gothic cathedrals that span across Ravnica, 
and seismic spike shows us the spire, an element of Ravnica that will become its defining feature in later blocks. Overall though, the first visit to Ravnica was very much seeking a foundation to build upon. There was little in the way of congruent world building, and the city itself was much more a backdrop than a character all its own. Seven years later, with a return to Ravnica, these issues would be addressed from the ground up. In September of 2012, art director Jeremy Jarvis published an article titled The Look of Ravnica. In the two-part piece, Jarvis described the processes that he and his team of concept artists took to update the visual identity of the City of Guilds. He writes, In preparation for the team's arrival, we printed out every single style guide page and card illustration from the original Ravnica block, taped them to the walls, and then proceeded to circle, mark, or take down the images based on what we thought worked, what perhaps needed a push, and what needed a full-on visual redirect. Along with costuming and the guild symbols themselves, a major element of Ravnica that needed reworking was its architecture. It is clear from the article that Jarvis wanted buildings that looked unique to each guild and aligned with the philosophies that they represented. In order to do so, Jarvis brought on the up-and-coming concept artist Sam Burley as an architecture specialist. And so in keeping with that spirit, I figured I should do the same for this video. So I called up my buddy Eric Zitterich to talk architecture. Yeah, so my name is Eric Zitterich and I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I graduated with a degree in architecture from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and the University of Notre Dame is a, a, a architecture program that focuses a lot on classical architecture and traditional architecture as opposed to more modern styles and contemporary styles. Uh, and right now I work for a, a high-end residential architecture firm here in Milwaukee. My first goal was to iron out the small details that separate the Azorius structures from those of the Boros. These guilds overlap quite a bit in their ideologies, but they separate drastically in the manners in which they enforce their ideals. Returning to Jarvis's article, the Azorius approach to architecture is centered on order. It is meant to force people into standing in lines, into being oppressed by the weight of the law. Jarvis wanted a hybrid between a library and a DMV. This drawing here shows an emphasis on circles as well as a low arch that keeps its inhabitants firmly in place. There is no wiggle room in jurisdiction, and the buildings reinforce this idea. Eric saw remnants of the Romanesque in this guild. The architectural style that was kind of in vogue before Gothic uh, was called Romanesque. It was a lot of very thick walls, round-topped arches as opposed to the pointed ones, and short, stubby columns holding things up. So it was a very robust architecture. Not a lot of light, not a lot of airiness, um, and kind of oppressive to be inside. Along with the motif of the triangle, the most integral and self-sustaining shape, the Azorius make great use of the dome. If Ravnica is defined by its spires, its antithesis would be a covered building that keeps all movement grounded. When the Renaissance architecture moved into Baroque, uh, circles were abandoned because it was too static of a shape. And here you have the domes contrasted with spires. The spires are so upward and so evocative that in contrast with these domes, these domes just kind of feel like stones in a pond. They're just there and they're not moving. And it, it really works with that feeling of, you know, waiting in line. You're gonna be here forever. These domes are gonna be here forever and so are you. Much like the Azorius, the Boros are also interested in oppression, albeit through much more physical means. They are the military units of the city, and their architecture reflects the order they seek to enforce onto the citizens of the plain. The easiest question would be for what is the personification of a Boros building? What does Boros actually stand for? They want you to feel safe because they are there, but it's not in a nice way. It's not like in a fatherly kind of way. It's in an oppressive way but they wouldn't really admit that firsthand to you. So we're looking for the personification of power, but with a hint of, of, of domination. If the Azorius embody the Romanesque, the Boros read to me like brutalism, the frigidness and indifference of concrete as a primary building material, and the intense weight that these structures personify emit feelings of subjugation. Brutalism is not playful. It is meant to call attention to the core purpose of buildings, that of providing solid shelter. Where do we get that feeling from? In terms of image making itself, what power often means is balance. I know exactly how the weighting needs to be, it needs to be balanced. I know that the verticals need to be dominant, so we're probably looking up 
at a building. That's when you get the really steep verticals going. And I know that I need to offset it with some horizontals. I need a very firm base. They're 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 not reckless power, right? They're they're grounded. So I also need to show the ground plane. So that's why I went for this big promenade going in. So you feel like they're accessible. There's a road that's going in and it's not, you know, barricaded off. So clearly you're free to go in and out as you please. But if you do realize that you're in the shadow of this great power. Great power is also communicated by the Orzov syndicate, but in the exact opposite way. If brutalism is a building stripped down to its core elements, then the Gothic movement of centuries prior was instead fully about exploring the decorative potential of architecture and its effects on those who enter. The Orzov represent opulence. They earn their wealth through exploitation and criminal activity, and their buildings serve to flaunt their morally ambiguous riches. So the, the cool thing about Gothic architecture was that it was kind of created by this group of rulers in France, and they all came to power and they were like, okay, we need to build buildings that are gonna prove that we are powerful, that we are wealthy. And so they set out and they, they started to build churches. Virtually every city in Europe impacted by Catholicism has a cathedral somewhere towards the center of town. With the innovation of the flying buttress came the ability to make thinner walls, and in effect, install windows. Stained glass became a way to communicate the major events of the Bible for the illiterate churchgoers, as well as a means to let more light into the building. In effect, entering a Gothic cathedral is very airy and uplifting. It is meant to be a marvel, an upward conduit to the heavens. The Orzov churches play with the same ideas. Returning to Jarvis, we ended up pushing the architecture into way overblown, grandiose churches, ceilings and arches far too high for any sort of practical purpose at all, then filled with walls of stained glass. The Orzov gag was needlessly high ceilings and arches with only human-sized doors. Because of the flexibility of a fantasy world, artists can also make use of stained glass as a plastic material or an adornment. Halcyon glaze from the original Ravnica block took that texture and turned it into birds. Gift of Orzova in Gatecrash did something similar, and is often referenced as one of the favorite pieces of this block amongst players. In 2019, with the announcement of War of the Spark, the teaser trailer leaned fully into this idea. The Planeswalkers, essentially the game's superheroes, are now the idols of the cathedral. Their images are venerated into stained glass and serve as a storytelling device, much like the subjects in the window panes of all those Gothic churches. Intertwining with Gothic aesthetics are the medieval Rakdos buildings, which lean into the flamboyant as a means of communicating their fascination with pain. Life is a circus to the Rakdos, and their buildings echo this core truth. Sinister and diabolic imagery emerges in the shape language of these structures, and their arches are always tall enough to allow for the Lord of Riots himself entryway into any of their shows. Red lighting and black paint are motifs. Eric took note of Rakdos Guildgate as an exemplary piece of their style and mood. I was noticing that a lot of the Rakdos kind of pushes towards the more medieval and the more castle and crenellation sort of moves, more so than the large gothic moves. You can see everything in that image kind of looks like cobblestones. I get more of that feeling that they are also maybe at an in-between point in the architectural style, you know, whereas like some of the more progressive guilds have moved on with their architecture and the Rakdos are like, man, like we got this sort of dungeon pointy vibe and we love it and we're going to stay. One of these more progressive guilds that Eric alludes to is, of course, the Simic Combine. In this guild, we see the most hodgepodge mixture of architectural styles. They tap into multiple centuries of development and, to me, best represent a city like Prague as it exists in the modern era. They also carry motifs of the highly decorative Art Nouveau movement that was ushered in at the turn of the 20th century. Perhaps its most famous artist, Alphonse Mucha, was a pioneer in this development and is celebrated in stained glass at the St. Vitus Cathedral at the center of Prague. The Simic, like Mucha, are interested in flourishes, in beauty, and in leveraging biology as a source of aesthetic inspiration. I think the Simic would have their own kind of subcategory, which would be symbiotic architecture between biological life forms and more mathematical design within architecture itself. They are the biggest mishmash of styles, with kind of which kind of reflects, you know, the way they approach their their creatures and their super mutants and their soldiers that they have. You know, they kind of experiment and mash things together. 
This one is, is really interesting because it really does feel like a European city. You have one style next to another style next to another style. As you walk down the street, and it's kind of this hodgepodge of styles across time that gives this a very interesting feel. And so, yeah, obviously all the stuff in the background is, is so much different than all the things in front, but I think that it, it just speaks to the sort of hodgepodge nature of the Simic Guild and the creatures and you know, everything is, is a hybrid. So this image, while the individual buildings are distinct, the image itself is a hybrid. Jen Ravenna's breeding pool also stands out as an exemplary piece of Simic ideals made manifest. They really kind of hit the sort of Art Nouveau feeling in this one, I think, too. It's still ordered, you know, there's still a series of arches, but the detailing of those arches is way different than any classical, even Gothic, even Roman or, or Renaissance architecture. But the form is there, even if the details are not. And so this building reminded me a lot of, of Gaudi's buildings. So the Simic are the most experimental in their architecture, and as a result, the most fantastical. They do not need to interface with our world to inform their designs. Perhaps in this way, they represent one of the avenues to the future, an insight into the potential of city life in the century to come. And this idea leads me to my final point about Ravnica. As both Eric and Titus have stated prior, Ravnica embodies centuries of human development wrapped in an artifice of fantasy. It is a city where conflicting ideologies can coexist, and every approach to life can express itself tucked away in its own district. The guilds are simulacra of these ideals. They lean into simplified tropes to make clear the divisions in thought. What I've hoped to say with this video is that buildings, too, can communicate an ideology. They are superficial and decorative, but also serve as a function for storytelling and a totem for identity. And fantasy stories have always been, to some degree, about imagining what life could have been like in a distant past, or what it may be like in a very real future. The architecture on Ravnica, in my analysis, explores both ends of this spectrum. Through these cards, we can look back into a very real human history, sidestep into an alternate universe, and also juggle with the harder-hitting issues that plague our lives in the present. One of these is, what will happen to our cities in a thousand years? The remaining four guilds provide some answers to this question. The Golgari suggest that all fades to ruin. They represent the first fall from grace and posit that, eventually, nature will consume us whole. Stephen Belladin's overgrown tomb is emblematic of this idea. It shows one of these prototypical Ravnican structures, fit with a dome and pointed arches, completely immersed in ivy and moss. It is underground, perhaps nestled next to one of Ravnica's main sewer lines, and uses time as a narrative device. Other pieces, like Volkenbaga's Golgari Longlegs, suggest instead that life can continue and thrive in the underworld. Maybe human societies can find a way to live without the sun. Resident Evil's Raccoon City played with this idea, and the Golgari approach seems to suggest that the fall of civilization can sprout a macabre rebirth. The Selesnia, then, are the other side of the same coin. Much of their architecture makes use of old ruins from an ancient city. They also believe in the resurgence of life and the symbiosis between the natural world and the constructed one. Selesnian cards show a much brighter and hopeful future. They've turned the mistake of the past into monuments from which to grow. The trees that rise from the cracks in the ground are not eyesores. They are to be built around and preserved, and perhaps even worshipped. If nature is destined to overthrow the concrete world, then the Selesnia welcome it as a positive and even ornamental force. Their polar opposite is the fully mechanized industrial wasteland of the Izzet League. I said in my previous video that the Izzet are Magic's riff on Blade Runner. Their world is entirely void of free roaming rivers and trees, and instead take the cityscape to its extreme. I think that the Izzet would find themselves at home riding the subway system of New York City, where grime and grit are byproducts of a landscape fully transformed into machine. The Izzet suggests that, if the world were truly to be covered in industry, life would keep charging on, full steam ahead. And this leaves one last guild to consider. I'd like to use this image to conclude all these thoughts about the functions of architecture and the role of a city. This is Gruul Guildgates by Alexander Forsberg. If the Golgari represent the first collapse of civilization, and the Selesnia are the eventual rebuilding and harmonizing with its ruins, then the Gruul are the exact moments that everything comes toppling down. 
I stated at the beginning that magic, at its core, is a game about resources. Everything revolves around the idea of the basic land. Ravnica took a leap into the urban center and explored all the facets of the developed world, but the Gruul advocate firmly for a return to the pastoral. They are the harbingers of nature. They wish to remind civilization of its roots and aggressively remove the structures that depart from that place of origin. This image is perfect, it is simple, it is legible, and it is hilarious. It communicates a profound resistance to urban sprawl and reminds us that nature is life's most powerful force. The torches are anti-Ravnican and echo old-timey fantasy aesthetics of Dungeons and Dragons. The collapsed stones around the door are reminiscent of the primary building blocks of the City of Guilds, and the graffiti symbol of the Gruul clans is properly applied in blood. This is far less a guild gate and much more a cry to return to the basics. Food, water, shelter, earth. That is the essence of the animal spirit. I will end with one last thought from Calvino's novel. Contemplating these essential landscapes, Kublai reflected on the invisible order that sustained cities, on the rules that decreed how they rise, take shape, and prosper, adapting themselves to the seasons, and then how they sadden and fall in ruins. I've partnered up with the beloved magic artist Seb McKinnon to help promote his second Kickstarter. This one, like the first one, has limited edition prints and playmats, including a few works from the latest Ravnica block. These will never again see print, so back the project before its deadline on April 22nd. And after supporting Seb's work, head on over to my shop to pick up my very first ever piece of merch. This is a limited edition 16 ounce rotundo mug with some Ristic Study stylings. It's sturdy and holds coffee, tea, hot chocolate, or cool lemonade. I'm only making 125 total, and when they're gone, they're also gone for good. Follow the links down below, and happy shopping. Thanks for watching.